good morning, y'all. Great to see you. Welcome everybody online, all our locations. Love you. Thank you so much for being here. If you're a guest, I'm Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful people known as Grace Community Church. So grateful you're here. If you're here and you're not a believer and you're just here checking things out, I'm so grateful you're here. What a what a gift you are. Just take it all in. And for the rest of you, so thankful for you. Excited about where we're headed today in our series, Overwhelmed, is we're going to tackle anxiety. I know no one struggles with that, but we're going to go ahead and tackle it anyway, all right? So let me pray and we'll dig in. Lord, thank you for everyone who have gathered in these places. And I pray in Jesus' name that we all leave here today a bit different because we've been in your presence and your Holy Spirit has spoken through your servant and your word and has brought such a new freedom to us. And we pray and plead it in Jesus' name, amen. I don't think I have to make a case about anxiety, y'all. I, I mean, I get something in the email once a week about new data about anxiety, and I, I think we all get it. And you could be going through anxiety, and, and like me, sometimes I go through it, and I don't even know why. I, don't, I can't even really pinpoint to anything. It's just something is off in me. Uh, maybe that's you, or maybe you have social anxiety, or maybe you're going through a season of anxiety because of what's happening with your family, or you just started school and the anxiety and overwhelmness that that can, it can be, or anxiety at work, or anxiety over your health, and there could be all kinds of things going on in your life. And I'm excited about how God speaks to that. But I did come across different types of anxiety and different types of people who have anxiety. And there were about nine to 12 of these from, from some psychologists. So I picked the top four. And we're going to do a little test here to see if you might find yourself in one of these. So here's the first one. Are you an all or nothing thinker? in the sense that you think in extremes. There is no middle ground. It's either all good or it's all terrible. Could that be you? Secondly, or could you be the mind reader? You have assumptions of what other people are thinking and doing in relation to you, and you always interpret it as negative. Thirdly, you, are you a mental filterer, where you dismiss all the positives, and among all those positives, there's this one little tiny negative that you just focus on. I do that after every sermon, y'all. Pray for your pastor. <laughs> or finally, and this was the big one, the catastrophizer. You assume the worst possible outcome and convincing yourself that it's going to definitely happen regardless of its actual probability. Now, how many of you go through these all in one day? <laughs> yeah. Well, the Lord speaks to that, and we're going to Psalms, where we're spending ma the majority, if not all, of our series in the letter, I'm sorry, in the book of Psalms, because it covers the entire range of hum humanity and human emotion, from being overwhelmed, to anxiety, to trauma, to depression, to loneliness, to suffering, all of those we're going to tackle in this series. And we specifically see it often with King David. Half of the Psalms are written by King David. And we see him as a very flawed warrior king man. And we also see the range of emotions he has as he goes through all the anxiety and depression and loneliness and fears that he goes through and how God uses that in his word to apply to us. So today as we unpack anxiety, there are many Psalms I could turn to. That's the beautiful thing about the Psalms is there's so many that address all these issues. But I, I wanted to go with Psalm 16 today because of how it's ministered to my heart in the midst of my life and anxieties I go through in my life, and I hope it means the same for you. So as we're going to see in this psalm, it's a short psalm, and we're going to see different truths that we can pull out of it and how it can apply to your life and mine to overcome anxiety in our lives. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you quite a few. There are going to be five truths that we're going to see today, and it's a little overwhelming. I, I hope I'm not overwhelming you. But my hope is you're going to get what's <laughs> overwhelmed you with anxiety over the sermon. Um, but I, I hope you'll take what's central, what we're going to see here in a moment, and then there'll be some in there that you can apply. And what I would invite you to do also at the very end of the message, I'm going to put all of those, all these five on the screen. And I want you to take a picture of that if you have your phone with you also pointing you to a means of anxiety today, to your phone. But I hope you can, take a, you can take a picture of it, and then I'll tell you what you can do with it this week, okay? Without further ado, let's jump in. To overcome, to beat anxiety, we see first in Psalm 16, you have to make the Lord your absolute good. 
Psalm 16, 1 and 2. David says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. So David continues stacking images. We saw him stack images last week from shelter to refuge to tower. So he begins with refuge. And I had in mind this week how when I was a kid, I built little tent cities in the living room of our home. I'd bring the chairs in and I'd drape sheets and quilts and then I'd fill the little tent with pillows and then I'd bring in a radio or the television and it felt so comfortable and safe there. And I, I, I like to think that's the image David is giving us, this, this refuge that we can go into where it's safe and we can find peace in, in, in God and in, in, in his presence because he, he says the Lord and, and God, we see three different times. Now, if we read that verse in the original language of Hebrew, we see he uses three different names for God. So let me read it to you in the way it was written. Preserve me, O Elohim, for in you I take refuge. I say to Yahweh, you are my Adonai. I have no good apart from you. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, this is David being anxious, man. He's wanting to go all for God. So God is my Elohim. That means he's sovereign over my life. There is nothing outside of his control, though it is outside of my control. It was what I shared with you by John Piper last week, that God is up to 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of about three of them. Also, when he says, God, you're my Adonai, that means you are my master. It means you take care of me, you provide for me, you guide me, you protect me. <clears throat> and then he uses the word Yahweh. Yahweh is the personal name of God. He's saying, God, you know me by name, and you've allowed me to know you by name, and we do so in Christ. And you know the intimate details of my mind and my heart. You know why I'm anxious. You know why I'm anxious when I don't even know why I'm anxious, but you know me. And he finds great comfort in that, do you? So that means this, whatever or whoever is making you anxious, you don't have to run into despair and hopelessness. You run into Adonai. You run into Elohim. You run into Yahweh in Christ Jesus. What great hope do we have? Now, what does that look like? Let's just get real practical. I'm going to try to be practical in this message as much as I can. First, you seek God. You run into God as you're all through Scripture. In, in Psalm 62, verse 8, it says to, that we can trust in the Lord at all times by, this is, it has to do with prayer, actually, by pouring out our hearts like water. What an image. Pour out your heart like water. That's a practical way that you make God your refuge. And also God's word, Proverbs 30, chapter 30, verse 5, says that every word of God proves true, for he is our refuge. So very practical. When you're anxious, go to God's word, get God's word in you. Go and pray to the Lord. One of the big anxious passages in the New Testament says, don't be, this is Philippians 4, don't be anxious for anything, but in everything through prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving. And that word supplication literally means taking a Coke can, shaking it up and opening it, and then it just spewing out. That's, that's supplication when you're anxious before the Lord. So that's how you make the Lord your refuge, and that's how you make the Lord your ultimate good. He says, David says, I have no good apart from you. No good apart from him. If you, if you miss anything else in this message, don't miss this. Because if you don't get this right, nothing else is going to fall into place. This is the top button through which all the buttons fall in line. He must be your absolute good because you're made for God. C.S. Lewis, he said this. He says, God designed the human machine to run on himself. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no such thing. So that's why you must make him your all, your ultimate good, because he is your peace that you seek. Psalm 16, 3, he goes on to write, David writes, as for the saints in the land, they are my excellent, or they are the excellent ones, and whom is all my delight. So David gets practical here. He says, making God my all, my ultimate good, and my refuge means I, he's given me God's people in which I can find refuge from them. I experience his goodness with them. What it means to be around God's people who are making God their ultimate good, how that would feed my soul. It doesn't just encourage me, it encourages my heart in Christ. And that's why I hope you keep coming. 
That's why I hope you keep coming and, and joining us. And I hope you don't come putting a fake smile on. I hope you come in tears. I hope you come when you're depressed. I hope you come when you're anxious. I hope you come when your life is falling apart. And I hope you come when life is really good because we're in this together and God has wired us to be on this journey together. You can't hate God's people and love God because God has made us to be with one another. And I would encourage those of you who are online, it's time for you to come back. It's time for you to be with God's people because David said, listen, David had known the worst of God's people. He'd been betrayed by God's people. He had been uh, attacked by God's people. So I don't know what your experience has been in the church. He had a rough go of it. But still, somehow, he knew the hearts of God's people that he wanted to be with, and he found refuge there. And then he says in Psalm 16, 4, the sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. So let me just make this really relevant for us. In other words, what David is saying, I am not going to look outside of God for my peace or my happiness. I'm not going to look for someone or something to give me peace. I'm going to look only to God. Why? Because looking for anything or anyone else outside of God for your happiness and peace makes for a horrible God. I've told my kids all their lives, they're, they're, they're into sports. I said, listen, sports is a horrible God. You're going to have ups and it's going to, it's going to bring sorrow if you find your identity in it. So will a boyfriend and a girlfriend. So will your children. Horrible gods. So will your work and your career and your money. All of that. Terrible gods to sacrifice your life for because they will bring sorrow if you look for happiness and peace. Are you with me? I've learned that the hard way myself. Church makes a horrible God. Only him. Only he is our ultimate good. C.S. Lewis put it this way. He says, what Satan has put into the Heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside God, apart from God. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. We know this deep down. So who or what are you looking for to escape into, to find your happiness and peace outside of God? You will not find it. It just brings more anxiety. So make the Lord your ultimate good. Secondly, we see from King David that we are to rest in the Lord. And in Scripture, we see to enjoy our lives. Rest in the Lord and enjoy your life, man. I have to remind myself of that. Rest in him and enjoy the life God has given you. I think it was author Jody Picole who once said that anxiety is like a rocking chair. You sit in the rocking chair and you rock and you rock and you rock, but you go nowhere. It does no good. And so we are to find our restlessness to find rest in God. St. Augustine once said that our hearts are restless and they do not find their rest except in him. So David puts it this way in Psalm 15, Psalm 16, verse 5. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. So right here, he's using the name Yahweh again. Yahweh, you are my chosen portion and my cup. That word portion, it comes from the idea of meat and the fat around the meat, which was called for the Hebrews the best portion, the best tasting that you could have. He's saying, God, you are the best. There's no one better than you. And he says, you are my cup, meaning the, a cup in which joy fills it and overflows it. In other words, he's saying, God, you are not only the best, you are my meaning. You are my purpose. You are my joy. You alone are my peace. My heart will rest in you. He goes on to say, you hold my lot, meaning you've assigned my lot. I, I, my life is the life you have given me. The lot had to do with the Old Testament when God assigned the 12 tribes of Israel land and boundaries. So he's saying, God, you've put me in a place of life. You've put in a boundary around my life. It is the life you've given me. 
And I live it knowing that you're in it with me. You hold me and my lot. And he says, this is a beautiful in inheritance and my lines have fallen in pleasant places. Meaning this, God, I'm not looking for another life. I'm looking for you. So this means what God has given you, the life he's given you. You don't, compare your, you don't have to compare your life to anybody else's because that's going to bring anxiety. You don't have to wish for another life. It, why? It's not going to happen. Enjoy the life God has given you. The, the lot he has assigned you as, as a means of grace. Now, there can be rough, a rough go in those places of life. It's called life. It's not, it's not something that God has done. It's what sin has done in us and around us, self-inflicted. But he's saying, God, you hold me. You hold my life. Then, he, then you can put it all together with a passage out of Ecclesiastes that says this. So I commend the enjoyment of life. Because there is nothing better for a person under the sun on the earth than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany them in their toil all the days of their life that God has given them under the sun. Now no, notice those words there. Toil. That means life is hard. Life can be exhausting. Life can bring anxiety. But God has given you your life right now. The breath you breathe is a gift. He's given you the life that you have. So what do you do with it? You rest in the Lord. He's sovereign over my life. And when I eat this buffalo chicken wing, I'm going to enjoy every bite. I'm going to focus on how good it is. I'm going to drink my sweet tea. You guys don't get that in the Northeast. But I'm telling you... <laughs> My mom's sweet tea is to die for. I'm going to enjoy this sweet tea, and I'm going to think about how good it is. And I'm going to look around and see what everything I can be thankful for that God has graced me with in my life. When's the last time you did that? Hmm. You know, you get to choose joy or anxiety in the end. I mean, that's a little simplistic, but at least it gives you something to shoot for. If I was to take us over to Philippians chapter 4, we see Paul in the same breath say, Rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. And then he says, don't be anxious for anything. Do you know science has proven that joy and anxiety travel down the same neural pathway of your brain? God already knew that long before science did. That's why Paul said, rejoice, don't be anxious. So you get to have a choice of what you're going to choose. That's why I love Psalm 118 when David says, this is the day that the Lord has made I will rejoice and be glad in it. What a way to do your day. Wake up and say, this is my lot today. Bad news may come today, but scripture says, I don't have to fear bad news for the Lord. I trust in him and he is my strength. So this is the day that the Lord has made. I will, I'm making a choice for my neural pathway to, to, to channel joy in my life as far as it's up to me. You with me? Rest in the Lord. And enjoy your life. Thirdly, David says this, trust the Lord to give you wisdom. Because often our anxiety comes down to, uh-oh, and what's this, and how am I going to do that, and what are we going to do, and we, we can kind of get stressed out about life. David says this, Psalm 16, 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, my heart instructs me. It's so simple, but so cosmic. Our part bless the Lord. The Lord's part gives us counsel. Our part, we worship him. His part, to give us wisdom. And to give us wisdom in ways we can't even comprehend. So he talks about, he instructs my heart in the night. I mean, God's not giving him dreams of the layout blueprint of what's to come and how he has to navigate it. No, there's just something about a soul resting in, I'm going to worship him and I'm going to trust that even in the night he's at work and when I face my day, he's been at work and I'm going to just navigate my life with my heart in him. So how could David have confidence though that God was counseling him in ways he couldn't even comprehend? Here's why. David filled his heart. He filled his heart with God's word. He filled his heart through praying to God. He filled his heart by being with God's people. And he filled his heart in worshiping the Lord. Are you with me? So how can you have confidence you're walking in the wisdom of God even when you don't feel it? You pray. You get in God's word and get God's word in you. You be with God's people who love the Lord with all their hearts and you worship him with your life. 
God also gives counsel, not only in the night, but in the day is the way I put it. God is the God of truth. All truth is God's truth. God uses truth in science to instruct us with counsel, especially in how we can navigate the hardships of life, even anxiety. So I came across a few psychologists and really dug into what were their studies and research showing about how we can apply God's truth and wisdom in our own lives in a practical way. So I, I found these to be the top ones. Practical ways to navigate anxiety is one, just be present. When you're feeling the stuff happening, it just practice putting your feet firmly on the floor and feeling how solid that is. And then just Selah, as we talked about last week, just be with the Lord. Be present in the moment. Also to breathe slowly, deep breaths in. Also to do things to distract from the anxiety. One, one psychologist said if, if you're anxious, chew gum because it helps get the nervous energy out of your system. Or hold ice in your hand or start at a high number like 500 and go backwards to kind of distract yourself from what's going on. Also to list out what may be making you anxious. I know for me, a practice I've done for a long time is when, when I'm anxious and especially when I don't know what it is, I'll sit down with a blank piece of typing paper and I'll just bullet point out everything in my heart that I feel like is bringing anxiety. And when I'm done, I pray through each one and then I rip it up and throw it in the garbage because I'm going to choose joy. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's something that God can lead us to do. Also, Christian therapy, highly recommend it. Maybe even medication for a season. Nothing wrong, nothing ashamed of right there. That can be, that can be life-saving in a lot of ways. So pursue that. God so leads. Also to limit things in your life. Number one, limit your phone, man. Limit your social media. That You're just being fed all the anxiety of the world into your heart and into your mind. Also limit caffeine. I don't recommend that. I got to have, <laughs> y'all, I got to have my coffee, man. And then one more, I think. Yeah, and then the big ones, right? You got to eat right, nutrition. As far as it's up to you, get your sleep. And then, of course, exercise in, in, in your life. These are important. So those are some, all truth is God's truth ways to apply this wisdom in your life. So trust the Lord to give you wisdom. Are you in his word? Are you praying? Are you with God's people? And are you worshiping him with your lips, your eyes, your ears, and who you are? Fourth way we see to overcome anxiety is to focus on the Lord in your struggles. Psalm 16, 8, I have set the Lord always before me, and because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. I have set the Lord always before me. So again and again, we're hearing this. If your dependence is on anything else other than the Lord that you've set before you, you will not find happiness and peace. It is not there. So David says, I have set the Lord always always before me. Notice how he said it. I have, meaning I have made the choice. I have made the decision. I've, I've put this before me and I put this before me and it just seems like there's more sorrows that come. I'm going to set the Lord before me. And if I wake up at 2 a.m. with anxiety, I'm going to set the Lord before me then too. If something bad news comes, I'm going to set the Lord before me. I'm going to focus on him. I'm not going to focus on her or focus on him or focus on that, which brings anxiety. I'm making the choice in this moment to set the Lord before me. He's the focal point. He's the fixed point to keep your life on when everything else is out of whack. So I'm in my 50s now, all right? And I, I, I still work out and that kind of thing, but it's a lot different now. When I was younger, I worked out for the biceps and the six-pack abs, you know? Now I work out so I don't fall down. <laughs> and if I do fall down, I can get back up. And so what, what this program I, I do is, you know, the lift weights and the exercise and all that, but I do a lot of mobility and, and balance exercises now, which are brutal. I'd rather lift weights. It's much easier. But to do it, you have to do crazy balance things and hold, hold it as long as you can or for however many breaths. And then the only way to stick it out is you have to, as they say, you got to fix your eyes on a point. Because if you're trying to do a balance thing and you're just looking all around, then you're, you're, you're going to be off balance. So you got to fix your eyes on a point for that. So in other words, David is saying, when life begins to knock you out of balance, when anxiety knocks you about, fix your eyes on the Lord. 
I've shared the ice skater thing before, how they ice skate and they turn around in a blur and I wonder how they come out of it without passing out or vomiting or something. It's because as they're spinning, they put their eyes on a fixed point. So in the same way, when God or when life brings chaos and knocks you around and chaos is all around you, fix your eyes on the Lord. When you're seasick, fix your eyes on the horizon. In the same way, when anxiety sickens you, Come back to be sure you have made the choice to set the Lord always before you. You with me? David says this is how he got through it, and he recommends it to us. Isaiah puts it this way. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed fixed on you because he trusts in you. And then David ends that little passage by saying that the Lord is not only before me, he's at my right hand. Now, there's Im- he's stacking images again. Here's the image he wants you to have. The Lord is always before me, and he circles me and comes to my right hand. What a beautiful image. It reminds me of a buoy, a buoy in the ocean. The storms hit it, and it knocks the buoys. I've shared this over the years, too. It's so helpful for me. The buoy gets knocked about by the wind and the waves, and it goes under, but it always buoys back. That's, that's what David is saying. He's in front, and he circles around me and makes me buoyant when anxiety comes into my life. And the only way that can happen for your life and mine is we got to focus on the Lord in the struggle. What are you putting before you that is not the Lord that you're trying to find balance or stability in? Pot is not going to deliver it. Uh, Alcohol is not going to deliver it. Matter of fact, it just prolongs it and increases the anxiety. Fame, fortune, all of that, nothing wrong with those. But in the end, if you're seeking it, to be finally I've arrived and I have peace, you're going to be sorely mistaken. The Lord must be your focus in the success and in the struggles to beat anxiety. So you got to make the Lord your absolute good. Rest in the Lord and enjoy your life. Trust in the Lord to give you wisdom. Focus on the Lord in your struggles. And then finally, rejoice that the Lord holds your future. Psalm 16, 9, therefore, so David is saying that whenever you see a therefore, know what it's there for. So he's just taken everything he's talked about and now he's summing it up. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices because my circumstances have worked out. Doesn't say that, does it? No, he's probably still in this situation. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure now in terms of even the future. He's saying this, the Lord holds my future. I'm secure right now because he holds it. You know who holds your future? And if you're as a parent, you know who holds your children's future? The Lord. The Lord holds our future. Christy, I think I've shared this before in the past, but Christy puts these little phrases on a, on, a, on a writing board in our kitchen. And I'm always excited about the next one she's going to put up there. It's always a mystery. And the one she had up there about a year or so ago was this phrase, what if it's wonderful? What if it's wonderful? Now, that's exactly the opposite of a catastrophizer, isn't it? To view life in the sense that I am his, he is mine, he's my Yahweh, he's my Adonai, he's my Elohim, I have chosen him and he has chosen me and I've set him before me. And when, when I look at the future... What if it's wonderful? And with him, it will be. Now, you may cry a bit. You may have struggles. You may have some losses and some bad news. But with him, you're good, man. He holds you. And he holds your future, as we see here. I mean, after all, what's anxiety going to do for you? Think about it. Does, you can be as anxious as you want over yesterday, but you cannot redo it. You cannot relive it. You can learn from it, but it's done. Trust the Lord who holds yesterday. Also in terms of even today, you cannot make someone love you. You cannot make someone forgive you. You cannot fix anybody else's life. You are not the Holy Spirit. Trust him who holds them and holds you. And oh, by the way, no matter how anxious you are about tomorrow's weather, not going to do a thing. It's going to rain or it's going to, the sun's going to shine. It, it's not. So why be anxious about anything else of tomorrow? That's why Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. It's going to have its troubles of its own. I love how real Jesus is. It'll have troubles of its own. But, G, but the Lord is with you in the present and, when, and he's with you in the night and he's going to be waiting for you tomorrow. 
Focus on the Lord and know that he holds your future. Psalm 1610, David says, For you will not abandon my soul to the grave, Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Right here, David is saying something that's really not true of him because he did go to the grave and his body did decay. He just told us about somebody to come. Matter of fact, Peter picked up and quoted David verbatim in Acts chapter 13 and said, there is one who came who, did not, who was not in the grave. There is one who came who did not decay because he rose from the grave and his name is Jesus. So right here, we understand where God becomes our ultimate good and where peace can begin to happen. Before you can have peace in your life, you got to have peace with God. And we know peace with God comes through faith and being born again in Christ where you are no longer an orphan but a child of God. And now you can trust him like a child. You can trust God to hold your future. But we become, man, do we become anxious over the future? One of, one of my kids, he's in high school. He's already fretting about retirement. I'm like, bro. You know, and then, then he's like, and then there's college and all that. I'm like, listen, man, you don't have to figure it out. Me and your mom, we got you. We got it. All right? You don't have to know the blueprint. You don't know what's going to happen then. And by the way, more so, the Lord's got you. He's got it. Hey, and the Lord's got you. He's got you. He holds your future. Psalm 16 and 11. I'm going to tell you what. This passage right here, this passage right here has got me through many a darkness and much and, and ministered to me through much anxiety. Watch this, and we'll land it here. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There is no challenge, there's no loss, there's no death that will ever take this away from you. Path of life, Jesus said, I have come to give you life and life to the full, John 10, 10. That's that cup. Meaning, purpose, joy that no bad news or struggle can touch ultimately in you because you're in Christ. Pleasures at the right hand of God. What an image. Pleasures at the right hand of God. That's a place. Death is only this for the Christian. It's a folding up of your tent and crossing over the Red Sea to home. That's all it is. Pleasures at his right hand forever. C.S. Lewis gives a an, an imagination of what heaven might be like and how in our humanity we could take it. The grass is too hard to walk on. It's like diamonds. The birds singing are too loud. You can't take it. The water they are running is too heavy. You can't even drink it. The colors are so overwhelming. You, it blinds you. Heaven, pleasures at the right hand of God. You know what heaven is? Everything is brand new every second for all eternity in his presence. And then you are in his presence, having the fullness of joy. You can have that presence with the inward eye of worship here and now. But then there's a very real presence you're going to be in for all time. And that word, by the way, in the original Hebrew language, there is no word for presence. You know what the word is? Face. Only face. You will be before the face of God. Can you fathom for a moment the day that will come when you fold your tent and you walk across the sea into the before the face of God and reaching out and touching the face of the one who made you. That should get you through many a dark night. James Gray, an author, wrote this. He said, who can mind the journey when the road leads home? So let's, let's put this on the screen. Get your phones ready. Make the Lord your absolute good. If you're an all or nothing thinker, if you're a mind reader, if you're a mental filterer, if you're a catastrophizer, make the Lord your absolute good. Rest in the Lord and enjoy your life. Trust the Lord to give you wisdom. Focus on the Lord in your struggles and rejoice that the Lord holds your future. So here's what you do with this, this week. And, and if you didn't have a chance to get it, we'll put this on, on, on social media. I want to encourage you just this week to take your Bible. If you don't have one, we have Bibles in the back of the seats. It's our gift to you. To take your Bible, open it to Psalm 16 and take this, these truths and put beside it. And all week, just take Psalm 16 and these truths and put it in your mouth like hard candy and let it just melt into your heart all week. And just see what the Holy Spirit will continue to draw out of it 
to your heart to give you more and more victory over anxiety. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you that there is an answer for our battles and our struggles and our anxiousness. And it is in the end that you are all, you are the best, you are our meaning, our purpose, you are our joy. Help our unbelief. Help us to see. Help us to know. Jesus, in the end, it is all you, and it is all about you. And we worship you. So we know in worshiping you, it lives our, lifts our hearts out of our despair and out of our anxiety to you as our hope. We worship you. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. amen.